and welcome everyone to our first of many online lectures dealing with our world history course. Today we're going to talk about the earliest humans, specifically human migration and the beginning of agriculture. Before we get started, we need to talk about a few things though, so make sure you pay attention. Uh, hey, guys, let's quiet down. No cell phones, no talking, no texting. You don't think it makes a sound? It does. I hear it. Click, 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 click. Okay, I know what you're thinking. You're a panda, man. What are you going to do about it? Check it out. Everybody. Oh, oh, oh. Pause of fury. What the? Get ready to feel the thunder. So, as long as you got all those things away, we'll be great. Now, as usual, or as you'll see in the future anyway, please make sure that you remember that we use these videos to help you guys out. If you have any questions after the video, feel free to review the video at your leisure to double check and make sure you get all the information you need uh, before a test or a quiz or whatever. So, <clears throat> with that, let's get started. So, like every other social studies class that you should have been in, I hope, you've got some key terms. Here we got four for this particular section. Take a second, look at these four terms, and become familiar with them. As with all social studies classes, please make sure that you become familiar with all the terms, not just the ones in the lecture. If you look on the back page of your uh, outline that you should have received already, are a list of all the different terms. Make sure that you become familiar with those. Put the definitions down on that back page, review them from time to time, get yourself super prepared with them. They are what's going to help you remember everything you need to know about the unit. So, now that we got that out of the way, let's get to the good stuff. So, human migration and the beginning of agriculture. Every lecture we start with a section called setting the stage, which gives us a little bit of background information or, or some standards, a place to start before we get into the new stuff. So, so a benchmark for where we're at. So today, our setting the stage is the question of who are we? Who are we as a people? How long have we been here? Let's see if we can get some of those answers question, or questions answered. So, evidence suggests that humans could be much older than originally had thought. Scientists use artifacts for answers. As you've learned, artifacts are anything that is left behind for, from people in the past to help historians learn about them in the future. So it could be as simple as a jar, um, makeup, pictures, uh, even uh, a pulled out tooth or something ridiculous as that may sound. All these different things that people have left behind are artifacts and these help us identify and learn more about the culture that we are studying. So make sure that you learn artifacts because you kind of need to know how to identify artifacts as a historian and be able to determine their significance. And as we just talked about artifacts Human-made objects like jewelry and tools used to help historians figure out more about a culture. Unfortunately, there's a time period known as prehistory, which tends to leave more questions than answers. Prehistory is exactly how it sounds. It's the time period before history. Well, how is that possible? What can be happened before? History. History is something that happened in the past. Well, prehistory is actually a time period that refers to when things happened, but nobody wrote them down. There's really no uh, documentation, no pictures, or, or nothing like that to really give us an indicator of what it was like for a people to be around during a certain period of time. So when you're looking back way at the caveman areas, maybe even before then, we know that people existed in some form, but we don't know about them. They haven't told us. They haven't given us some sort of written account. So this is the time period of prehistory. We have no idea about what happened other than the artifacts that were left behind, uh, as well as maybe some skeletons and things like that. And again, like I said, prehistory before the invention of writing. Much more simpler than what I just said, I think. All right, moving on with our um, setting the stage. The important thing to know about world history, or any history for that matter, is that the story is never complete, and there are many questions left to be answered. There's always new things about history that are being found out all the time. Just in the last couple months, 
uh, in 2000 or 2016, we found out that there might even be a new species of human that had never been found before or realized before. And they used different type of archaeological techniques, such as looking at the, the tools that they had, look at where they found them, look at the bone structures, the bone density, the size of the jaws and the skull and stuff like that, and try and figure out, I found out actually that this is a new type of human species possibly. So the story is never complete. They're always finding new stuff. And that's the important thing to realize with any history, particularly about prehistory, because we know so little about it. And the little things that we learn, the little new things that we learn, is a big deal, because it just helps us fill in the blanks of those things we don't know. Now, when we go way, way, way back, like way back, there are two prevailing ideas on how life on Earth started. Okay, You may know of them already. The first, creationism. The idea that some sort of higher power put humans on Earth. God, Allah, Brahma from, Hindu, or from Hinduism, whatever. Okay, Somebody had some idea and made it happen as far as human on Earth. That's creationism. The other one is known as evolution, or evolutionaries. People that believe that humans evolved from some other being, or that humans continue to evolve. They started at some sort of basic foundation, some sort of something, animal type possibly thing, and then evolved into what we have today. And the theory that even today we are still evolving and there is some evidence to support that, actually. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the coming uh, days and weeks, and maybe even throughout the semester, and how people are still evolving. People are getting taller, for example, than they had been hundreds or hundreds of years ago. So, we'll get into that. But those are the two main theories. Now, I'm not here to debate which one's right, which one's wrong. I'm just here to tell you that we're going to talk about both uh, throughout this semester and throughout this year. What we do know is that there's evidence to support humans were around a lot longer than what the traditional Christian belief says. Okay, They typically believe Christians were around about, was it, four to six thousand years. That's how long humans have been around, according to Christians. Okay, When in fact we found things in Africa that show that humans in some form have been around a lot a lot longer than 6,000 years. So let's take a look. Anthropologists, uh, who are people that study uh, cultures, as well as paleontologists, people who study fossils, have attempted to use artifacts and fossils to understand early human culture. These two types of experts and others take their expertise, their understanding, and work together to learn about a culture and a people. Um, Obviously, paleontologists look at the bones. They look at the bones and they re realize, okay, how old are these bones? Based on the density of these bones. What was a person's diet like? What were they eating? Were these bones brittle? Were they strong? It kind of tells us about maybe were they very strong back then or did they have a poor diet? As compared to anthropologists, which look at the artifacts, the pots, the jewelry, the uh, homes that people lived in. And together they kind of start putting this puzzle together to figure out what it was like for a particular culture in a particular place at a particular time. Okay, Learning about these people. Now, culture is kind of a big broad word. But if we had to break it down, it comes down to two, just a couple words. Okay. It's a people's unique way of life. Okay, well, what makes a people unique? Well, hopefully, this kind of graphic organizer will show you that there are four general things historians look at to kind of determine what a person's culture or a group's culture is like. We look at their values, the things that are important to them. We look at their attitudes towards different things. Do they like war? Were they more at peace? Did they find uh, trade important? What are their attitudes towards different things? We look at their beliefs, particularly their religious beliefs. And then finally, we look at their customs. 
what traditions do they have? Do they have holidays? Do they have a certain dressing uh, array that they do? Do they uh, do different uh, dances and and uh, how do they take care of their animals and things like that? What do they do with with that? So a lot of different elements together makes a group's culture. And because every different place has different traditions and different beliefs and different values and different attitudes, it's a unique culture to that area. Even Milwaukee has its own culture that is separated from, we'll say, Sheboygan or Madison or Chicago. There might be some similarities, but it is unique in its own way. So when we talk about culture, we're talking about a, a people's uniqueness compared to others around them. All right, let's talk about Lucy. And I don't mean Lucille Ball, and I don't mean Scarlett Johansson in that awesome movie that was out a couple years ago. No, I'm talking about the original Lucy, like three million years ago, Lucy. All right. Yeah, they didn't call her Lucy back then. We don't know what her real name was back then, but let's take a look at her and, and see if we can uh, learn something about her. Lucy was actually a set. Uh, it was a skeleton that was found. Uh, 1974, okay, by Donald Johansson in Africa. Now, what made Lucy unique is the fact that she was, at the time, the oldest bipedal hominid that had been found, okay? Bipedal, meaning two feet, able to walk on two feet. Hominid means human-like being, Okay, so she was the oldest bipedal hominid that had ever been found. How old was she? About three and a half million years old. Okay, very old. Okay, I think I said six million, but it's a brain fart. Three and a half million years old is when it's believed that she lived, based upon the different uh, carbon that had been found in her bo in her bones. Uh, what are what? Uh, these paleontologists do is they study the bones and when the body dies it starts collecting carbon and they can determine based upon the amount of carbon that's in a bone how old it is how long it's been there so they use carbon dating as well as some other techniques to figure out that she was somewhere around three and a half million years old or had been there for that long now Lucy the name actually came from a Beatles song okay which uh, was Lucy in the sky with diamonds why are they called it that? I don't know. I guess the guy liked the name of the song and they had to give her a name. They knew she was female based upon the pelvis bones um, and just the bone structure. They knew that this, this skeleton was female and they just decided to call her Lucy. There you go. And there's Lucy right there in all of her glory. This is actually just a cast of the original bones. They keep the, the originals in a very secured place temperature controlled area so it doesn't degrade the bones and things like that but these are the parts that they did find and again based upon the density of the bones um, how the pelvic bone was shifted more uh, in a certain way instead of angled that way they could figure out that it was female and figure out that she was able to walk straight up as compared to other animals or primates where their their um, hips are actually bent down more they can figure out that she walked on two legs so good for her Another finding was what we now know as the Laetoli footprints. Now, there wasn't any skeleton or anything found here, but what was found were two footprints in volcanic ash, also in Africa, not too far away from where they found Lucy. Probably not Lucy's footprints, but could have been a, a cousin of hers, okay? Distant cousin, we'll say, not like aunt's kid. Okay, we're talking like distant cousin relative somewhere down the genome line. So, found some footprints in this volcanic ash that had been covered up and preserved for millions of years. Well, here we see 3.6 million years old that they figured out that these footprints were. Um, as we see, 1978 was found by Mary Leakey and her team of uh, scientists. What they, they were able to figure out how old they were by peeling back the different layers of the ground that had been in this very this hot spot for archaeologists um, they and they just kept peeling stuff back and eventually they came across this indented layer 
and the more layers they pull off, they know how, how old a layer is, based on how thick it is, how dense it is, what type of rock it is, um, things like that. So they're able to peel back these different layers, and however many layers they peeled back, they were able to find these footprints and realize, oh, we're on like the fifth layer. That's about 3.6 million years ago. Okay. What makes this interesting of a find is that not only did it find a pair of feet indicating bipedal, but they found two pairs of feet side by side going in the same direction. And actually one of the pairs of feet, they actually show like the person stopped and turned based upon the footprint and then turned back and continued walking, indicating that one of those people actually stopped and turned around to look behind them. Who knows what was going on? We don't know if it was male or female, but what this does show us is again that back then that there was some sort of hominid that could walk on two feet and that they were social. Okay, that there was some sort of social gathering between these two of them. They either male and female, we don't know, but it certainly adds another piece to the puzzle on trying to understand what it might have been like for people way back, way back, way back millions of years ago from the time that we know some sort of hominids existed. And here is a, um, a molding or a cast of the footprints and you can kind of see them kind of walking away as they go. All right, so neither Lucy nor the Laetoli footprints were made by actual humans as we call them today. Okay, things, humans back then were most definitely not the same as humans today. You can kind of get a, a sampling of the pictures here at the bottom. Humans may have looked something like this. There's different beliefs, there's different theories on what primitive uh, hominids looked like. But in any case, what we see as humans today is definitely not how it was back then. Okay. Other beings, such as Crohn Mangones, Homo erectus, and Neanderthals, walked on Earth way before we did. Okay? These were different species of hominids. If you're trying to figure out, what do you mean, species? There's more than one human species? Yes, there was more than one type of hominid or human species. Okay? Now think of it this way. How many different kinds of felines are there in the world today? When I say felines, I mean cats. Okay? Not just your domestic house cat. I'm talking about lions, tigers, pumas, cheetahs, okay? Those kinds of cats, okay? They're all types of cats, but they're different, okay? Some are taller, some are shorter, some are short-haired, some are uh, different predatory instincts. Um, they all have some sort of similarity, but they're still different. Well, it's the same for humans. The only main difference is, is that most of these different species of humans or hominids did not live during the same period of time. Some died off, some evolved, so on and so forth. Currently, the only human species that is around is our species, okay? But, or which is the Homo sapiens, which we'll talk about in the next slide. But what's important to know is that there is really no link that we have found definitively that says these really old species of, of hominids relates to us genetically. Okay? Depending on who you talk to, depending on the scientist, they're starting to find DNA evidence to support that maybe there's some stray um, genetic similarities, maybe some of these different hominids intermingled, um, creating new types of hominids and new types of species by, by uh, breeding differently or whatever. None of us were there, okay? But as science be continues to evolve and become better, so does our understanding of history. So once we get um, more science, more research, more understanding, we're able to research this old stuff and come up with new findings. So it's kind of exciting stuff. All right, now that we're done with talking about these hominids and how old they are, now we're going to talk about them migrating and getting out of Africa. Okay, so that's basically what this chart does. If you take a look and follow all the arrows, you can see that they actually end back 
in central eastern Africa. Okay, what we know is that somewhere about a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand years ago, okay, so recent history when you look at millions of years, like Lucy, 3.6 million, as compared to only a hundred thousand years ago, okay, they started leaving Africa. They started getting out, spreading their wings, moving around. Why? Well, there's some reasons why we think why. Let's take a look at that. So, humans, as I mentioned before, such as ourselves, are known as Homo sapiens, which means wise men due to our brain size. When you look back at all the different hominids that they have found, they found out that the current brain, brain size of our noggin is the biggest of all of them in general, which means big head, big brain, we must be smarter. Makes sense, right? So that's where we get the name Homo sapien or wise men. Eventually, Homo erectus, or humans who could stand up, and Homo sapiens, which are what we are today, decided to migrate out of Africa. So here we're getting the suggestion that around 100 to 150,000 years ago, Homo sapiens started evolving similarly to what we see today in some way. Early humans were nomads. Simply put, they moved around. They were mobile people. They'd move from place to place, foraging, searching for new types of food to survive. Okay? They didn't know how to farm. They pretty much just moved where the food went. Okay? They were also hunter-gatherers. Okay? They would hunt for their food, get their meat. They would gather whatever berries or fruit they could find from wherever they are. Um, and that's how they survived. And there we go. Hunter-gatherers would collect the food supply by hunting animals and collecting food from plants. I just said that. So, estimates show them leaving somewhere between 100,000 to 150, so we'll just break it even and say 125. Somewhere around this time period, they started leaving Africa. All right, so, looking back at that map, we're not going to slide back, but if you follow that map, you can see that early humans, homo sapiens, settled Europe around 33,000 years ago. They got to China about 67,000 years ago. Australia 38,000 years ago. North America only 12,000 years ago. And South America somewhere between 12 and 33,000 years ago. How we know this is based on a multitude of reasons. Primarily it's because of the artifacts that have been left behind. Very similar artifacts, very similar um, technology that had been used from one place to the next. And then we start seeing that stuff, the, the tools evolve into something new. And again, something newer after that. So we're able to kind of see a trail of these tools getting better and more efficient or not, whatever the case may be. So we can kind of follow a trail of where these people went and how long it was that ago that they use these tools. Again, they use also whatever bones or skeletons they found. They use uh, carbon-14 to, to try and figure out the density of the bones, again, like we talked about. But using artifacts, they're able to trace back how old somebody was who lived there during that time using that tool or using that um, pot or had that doll or whatever the case may be. This social shows, because of the tools that they used, that humans started using technology, applying knowledge to create tools and inventions to meet their needs. That's what technology is. It's not using a computer by flipping on a power switch, okay? Technology is simply coming up and creating something to help them with a need. So back then, a metal, uh, bronze metal spearhead that they could have created by hand during the Bronze Age. That's an artifact. Okay, um, Creating a backpack from some old bones or from some wood and some cloth from a kill from uh, a wildebeest or something. That's a technology. So anything that they created to help them out and make their lives easier would be considered a, a piece of technology. Things that they made to meet their needs. 
So, why exactly would these people leave Africa? I mean, it's a beautiful place. Back, uh, back then, this is a tropical area. The weather is probably similar to a rainforest. They got water, uh, they got greenery, plenty of sun, right? So why would they want to leave? Well, you need to remember, these guys were hunter-gatherers, okay? And as people started evolving, as population began to build, there became more competition. More people means more food needed, more bushes and berries needed, okay? So now there's more competition and less food. That's one reason. Two, you got to follow the animals. If the animals are going to leave, and they're the ones that you eat for their meat, you need to kind of follow where they're going, okay? So as some of the animals started leaving the area, or as they would, the amount of air, animals in one area would diminish because of all this competition with other people going on, people had to start looking for animals, looking elsewhere. So they started spreading out, trying to follow or find new sources of meat and food. And simple human curiosity. Um, humans are curious by nature. Whenever your mom says don't do something, what do you do? You do it anyway, right? So simple human curiosity also led these people to move on and see what is outside of their backyard and beyond. Now, agriculture is the game changer, okay? Agriculture changes everything. Early nomads lived in groups somewhere between 25 and 70 people. They would live together, small families um, or small groups of families moving together as a group for the self-preservation of one another. They helped each other survive, okay? But they would have to keep moving and finding more food and, and continue on, okay? They would never really live in the same place longer than they could in order to survive. But around 10,000 years ago, in the Neolithic Revolution time period, or Neolithic time period, um, they began farming, okay? As the story goes, I don't know how they figured this out, but as the story goes, that some women, probably women, while the men were off hunting, had some seeds, found some seeds, possibly some apple seeds or something that they had already eaten, and decided to start throwing these seeds into the ground, maybe plant them. I mean, these, these bushes come from the ground, so let's try putting the seeds back in the ground and see what happens. Well, guess what? They came back later on and realized that these seeds that they planted grew more trees or grew more fruit or whatever that they, they had planted. Well, they started realizing that, why should we have to keep looking for our food? Why can't we just stay in one place and make our own food? What an idea! So now they, have to, now they decide to start sticking around their area now that they can produce their own food. No more walking, right? Saves a heck of a lot of time on your sandals. Don't have to replace them all the time. So, seeds, agriculture, farming. It's the new thing during the Neolithic time period, also known as the Neolithic Revolution. Rising temperatures worldwide also allowed them to kind of stay in one place. Temperatures are becoming more stable, more predictable, so they're able to kind of stay in one place longer, um, which also helps them with their longer growing season. Um, if you plant, even today, if you plant the wrong crop at the wrong time in the wrong place, it's not going to last. Well, these guys figured out over time, and we're talking hundreds, thousands of years probably, that they realized the best time to start planting and the best time to harvest before it gets too cold. So again, the, the world is changing as well, not just the people. Now, farming produces more food. If you can control how much you make, that means you can make more food, right? And they found out that farming produces more food than both hunting and gathering. Okay, so this is a good thing. And here's my little comic strip. I'm tired of hunting and gathering too, but nobody invented the grocery store yet. Well, now they might be able to since they've learned the, the agricultural aspect what they need to do. So, once they learned how to create more food, more food means more people, higher population, more labor. More food means more people to do stuff, more people to farm. Not a bad idea, right? 
Now, because of these new uh, this, this new agriculture, people don't want, no longer have to move around. They can start creating more permanent settlements, starting with these small villages, maybe of only 25, 7,500 people. But then as people start coming in, they start realizing, hey, you've got some good soil here. I'm going to plant some stuff too. And then they just start sticking around. More people start flocking in, and you get small communities. Some were getting into the number of 200, 300, maybe up as high as 1,000. Okay, we're starting to get these small civilizations, which in turn is starting to create new cultures. Permanent settlements turned into villages. Villages turned into cities. Cities turned into civilizations. Now, once you've reached a certain population, all these people do not need to be doing the same thing. All 500 people in your city do not all have to be making or plowing the fields. All right. Now there's people that can do other specializations. Maybe one group of people is responsible for plowing the fields. Another group of people is responsible for making the tools to plow the fields. Another group of people is responsible for, as we'll see in a minute, domesticating animals or taming animals, making sure that they stay within a fence area, um, and start starting the idea of making butcher shops so that you can feed all the people. And why not start with trade? I'll give you some of my meat from my butcher shop if you give me some of your berries from your farm. Okay. So now we start talking about barter and trade. And as we'll see throughout this whole year, trade is a big deal. If you're a civilization that does not trade, you are a civilization that will fail. And that holds true even today. Specializations, as I just mentioned, the development of skills in a specific kind of work other than farming. Okay, kind of what I just talked about. So, with agriculture, eventually you're going to have to look at different ways of expanding your farm fields. So back then, they would use one method known as the slash and burn method. If your city is getting too big and you're running out of space, you got trees, well now you got to get rid of these trees to make more room for your farm. So they would use this slash and burn method. It's exactly how it sounds. They'd cut down the trees and they'd burn what's left, okay, putting it into ash. Now, this ash would create nutrients into the ground, allowing them to help uh, some of the plants grow better problem is, and we even have this today in some countries, that if you overproduce a type of uh, food or vegetable or something on one plot of land, that area is going to die of nutri nutrients. So um, sometimes these people would wear out the farm fields and stuff like that. Um, but again, we're not going to get into all the specifics on that. Um, but the important thing to know is there's a slash and burn. They would burn and slash the land to make more room for more agriculture so more people could farm and more people could survive in that particular, uh, in that particular city. And as I mentioned, domestication of animals. Why go hunting for animals when you can just go out in the backyard, open up the gate where all your cows are, and slaughter one? And I got meat for the next two weeks, or however long you need, right? Sounds like a plan to me. Now you can farm right outside your door. Now you can uh, raise your own sheep, raise your own goats, raise your own cows on the other side. You got milk, you got food, you got all that stuff. And you don't, don't even have to leave your yard. Sounds like a good thing to me. Now we don't have to worry about walking so far. So, main thing to remember is, all the stuff that I talk about did not happen overnight. It took a period of hundreds to thousands of years for all these different new technologies and new advancements and new way of, of thinking to evolve. Okay, So the idea of domestication of animals, planting food, starting of these civilizations and these cultures took hundreds to thousands of years. Did not happen overnight. Make sure you know that because it just sounds, because this is such a quick lecture, it sounds like it happened overnight. Didn't happen that way hundreds to thousands of years for these things to develop and get better for them to be able to use it the way that similarly to the way we use it today. All right, so we are done with this lecture today, which is awesome. However, coming up on our next lecture, we're going to be talking about some of the old civilizations. Now that we've learned about who these people are, let's talk about where they lived and why they chose where they lived. Specifically, we're going to talk about the city of Sumer, Sumer or Summer depends on how you pronounce it, um, in the region of Mesopotamia. Also, 
in the region that we call the Fertile Crescent. So with that, I am done. I'm sure you're thankful for that. This was the first of many lectures we're coming up on for this year, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you do have any questions, please make sure you contact me whenever you need to, or review the video to help you prepare for a test or quiz. And with that, I'm out. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.